Red hair is a minority trait today, even in countries such as Scotland and Ireland, where there's a higher incidence of it. However, when people speculate about where it comes from, we often think in terms of a specific region, tribe or people. Was there a tribe of people at some point in history that was completely red-haired? Did it spring up independently in one particular place, either randomly or as a consequence of some specific circumstance or environment? Or has it sprung up in multiple places or for multiple reasons? These are all interesting questions which no one really has a definitive answer to. In this video, we're going to explore the idea that redheads are a product of melting pot cultures. Throughout history, red hair has often been disliked and distrusted, and if we're to believe some accounts, even persecuted. For instance, take this often repeated observation from Aristotle. Those with tawny colored hair are brave, witness the lions, but those with reddish hair are of bad character, witness the foxes. Likewise, the following medieval proverb, Si ruba est fidelis, diabolus est incoelis. If the redhead is faithful, the devil is in heaven. Or this similar variation found in German, Rote Haare, Sommersprossen, sind des Teufels art genossen. Red hair and freckles are the devil's own kind. Or the old Russian proverb, there are no red-haired saints. In European folklore, the hair color has also often been associated with the figure of Judas, with terms like hair of Judas and Judas beard denoting the color. Likewise, the fallen figure of Mary Magdalene was often depicted in art with the hair color. The color has even been associated with vampires, witches, and lepers. One work published in 1662 stated that Indian Muslims have an aversion for such as are red-haired out of an opinion they have that they are leprous. And the writer Montague Summers stated that there were traditions in Eastern Europe of red-haired vampires labelled the children of Judas that killed their victims with a single bite or kiss. In the 1700s, there was even a treatise published that advised against the use of a red-haired wet nurse, stating that a wet nurse must not be red-haired nor marked with spots. Going on to add that the milk from a red-haired nurse often hath a sour, stinking and bad scent. It brings to mind the idea that red hair, spots, freckles and moles were viewed as evidence of witchcraft and likewise reminds us of Shakespeare's description of the deformed slave Caliban in The Tempest. A freckled whelp, hag-born, not honoured with a human shape. There are even claims that red-haired people were once sacrificed for possessing the hair colouring. Most notably, the claim in Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bow, that red-haired men were ritually burnt in honour of Osiris in ancient Egypt their ashes scattered with winnowing fans. Thankfully, the modern world isn't that bad. Still, though, redheads today will often ponder escaping the taunts and sense of alienation that accompanies the trait. The dream being that perhaps somewhere there's a redhead homeland, where everyone looks freckly and ginger. If not in the modern world, at least somewhere in the ancient past, some distant romantic land, or forgotten kingdom. As when you feel like an outsider, it's only natural to wonder where that outside place was that you've somehow came inside from. However, what if the red hair is coming from inside the building? If we look at the distribution of red hair, we could make the case that red hair occurs where we have cultural melting pots. A classic case in point being Ireland and Scotland. Though seemingly isolated on the northwestern edge of Europe, Scotland and Ireland are perfectly situated for sea travel, a stepping stone between the northern Nordic regions and the Mediterranean. And this is in fact what we see when we look at Irish history, with tales of settlers arriving up from Iberia and Vikings coming down from the north. 
We could also make the case that the Russian patch we see on red hair maps is similarly situated, a natural melting pot, this time linking the Middle East with the Nordic regions via Black Sea trade routes. Another place we see red hair crop up with surprising frequency is biblical history, with figures such as Esau and King David said to have been ruddy or red-haired. And similar to Judas' beard, we also have the descriptive term Abram hair, a label said to denote the colour auburn, implying that the colour was associated with the biblical Abraham. In fact, it could be said that in ancient times, before the advent of major oceanic sailing, Egypt and the wider Middle East would have been a natural melting pot, a meeting place for tribes, kingdoms and traders. It's also worth noting that in more recent times, it's often been observed that red hair appears more commonly amongst Jewish populations. For example, one 19th century article noted that there were thrice as many red-haired Jewish people as either Poles, Russians or Austrians, and half as many again as Germans. It's also been said that in Russia, red hair was viewed as a Jewish trait. Another place we seem to see an over-representation of redheads is in royalty. Along with King David, other famous red-headed royals include Elizabeth I, Richard the Lionheart, Henry II, the Holy Roman Emperors, Frederick I and II, Ismail I, Shah of Persia, and even Egyptian rulers like Cleopatra and Ramesses II. On a side note, and returning to earlier themes, Baldwin IV, the 12th century king of Jerusalem, was actually described as a blue-eyed, freckled, leprous evildoer. As royals often make marriage alliances with other royals from foreign kingdoms, royal households will naturally likewise be melting pots that cross oceans and tribal boundaries. A further thing perhaps worth mentioning is Aristotle's quote, stating that fishermen, divers for murex, and generally those whose work is on the sea, have red hair. Perhaps this observation taps into a notion that port cities, with their comings and goings, engender a greater degree of tribal mixing, and consequently a higher incidence of freckles and red hair. The countless pirates, nicknamed Redbeard or Barbarossa, also spring to mind. This association of red hair with the sea has a logic to it. If we consider the human colour spectrum, there's a natural gradient from light to dark, a feature of the relative levels of sunlight. In the far north of Europe, we have low sunlight, giving rise to blonde hair and fair skin. At the equator, with the sun at its extremity, we get dark skin and hair. Between the two, there is a gentle transition, encompassing all the shades in between. There are two pigments that are responsible for the colour of skin and hair in humans. One is eumelanin. This is responsible for black or brown colouring. The other is pheomelanin, which imparts a range of yellowish to reddish colours. Pheomelanins are particularly concentrated in the lips and genital areas, hence the red or pinkish colouring. Humans across the spectrum have both pigments, and generally in a similar ratio people with dark skin having high amounts of both, people with light skin, low amounts of both. In each case, the eumelanin higher relative to the pheomelanin. However, people with red hair have much higher levels of pheomelanin in relation to eumelanin. It could be that gingerness is therefore a consequence of diverse gene pools that have the capacity to produce this otherwise uncommon imbalance. If we imagine people living in areas of low sunlight, with low levels of both pigments, if they mate, any potential offspring will naturally inherit only low levels of both. Even if a person marries someone from a nearby tribe, that tribe, being situated in a similar geography, will likewise have similar pigment levels. The same is true for people living in areas of higher sunlight that marry people from a similar background the potential variation will be mild. However, 
once you get sea travel and the opportunity for humans to meet other humans from much further afield, the possible range of pigment levels any child may inherit increases. So, for example, someone could potentially inherit the higher levels of pheomelanin from their darker-skinned ancestors, but the relatively lower levels of eumelanin from any light-skinned ancestors on their family tree, giving rise to red hair or freckles. With some genes being recessive, it may take multiple generations for these effects to become apparent. If we look at how gingerness manifests, we can see this mixed nature the brown freckles, a consequence of the pheomelanin, on the fairer skin, the ruddy tinge, the hazel eyes that often accompany it, a seeming meld of brown and blue, and of course, the hair itself, fair yet full of colour. There's also the common misconception that redheads are paler than everyone else, even blondes. However, this is no doubt simply an optical illusion. The contrast of the freckles and rusty hair against the low U melanin skin, giving the appearance that the fair skin is especially pale. This also explains why not all redheads have the same skin and hair tone. You even sometimes may see dark skinned people with freckles whose hair has a slight reddish tinge to it. This is all due to the relative levels of pheomelanin, so a person who isn't very light skinned can still look ginger if they've inherited higher levels of pheomelanin than would normally be present for someone of their skin tone. Interestingly, we can see a good illustration of this when dark-haired people try to bleach their hair. Rather than turning bottle blonde or white, they're often left with hair of an amber or orange colouring. This is because the bleach destroys the eumelanin more readily, leaving the pheomelanin visible and apparent showing that darker-haired people do indeed have the pheomelanin that would otherwise produce red hair, were it not masked by the higher eumelanin. Though this theory dispels the idea that redheads are paler, it also strengthens some of the other stereotypes associated with red hair. For instance, the idea that redheads are more highly sexual. The redder parts of the human body, such as the lips, nipples and genitals, are also areas with more nerve endings. So it makes sense that higher relative pheomelanin, the red pigment, would be associated with a greater sensitivity to touch. Likewise, this would help to explain why redheads are purportedly more sensitive to pain and changes in temperature. Hence, reports of redheads needing more anaesthetic at the dentist. This heightened sensitivity may also help to explain the association with witches and prostitutes. So in conclusion, looking at things through this lens, we can see redheads not as outsiders, as such, but as a product of human mixing, and of civilization or city living itself, arising and bubbling up where cultures cross. And the negative stereotypes also have their positive counterparts. Just as Judas has a red beard, we also often see Jesus depicted in art with red hair, his chestnut locks having a Mediterranean tinge. So too, the positive counterpart of the fallen Magdalene, the Immaculate Mary. She, likewise, has been depicted with reddish hair. Take the following description from a work by the Jesuit hagiographer, Pedro de Ribadeneira. The Virgin Mary was of a middle stature, though some say she was rather tall, her complexion was somewhat swart, her hair reddish and golden, her eyes lively and quick, the hairs of the eyelids somewhat red, the eyebrows arched black and comely, the nose somewhat long, vermilion lips most sweet in speaking. One thing to note about this description is its compound nature. The Virgin Mary is swarthy, with beautiful black eyebrows, yet her hair is also red and golden, almost embodying the whole spectrum of humanity, a symbolic composite of all mothers, just as Jesus is a symbolic stand-in for all mankind, the symbolic alchemical man. Bringing to mind Cyrano de Bergerac's poetic claim 
that redheads have great virtue due to their balanced constitution, and that red hair, like fire, contains the most essence and the least substance. The freckled Mashiach, or the treacherous Judas. Red hair, a product of our human melting pot. Symbolic of both its good and bad potential.